the Hocking River Valley in southeastern Ohio. It was here, starting in the 1800s, that coal became the lifeblood of the region. From what is considered to be the very first coal mine in the valley, the small Johnson Hill mine located just north of Nelsonville, the industry grew to major proportions. Benny credit one man, Lorenzo D. Poston, as being the catalyst for the development of the coal industry in southeastern Ohio. Poston arrived in Athens County in 1830. By 1835, he opened a general store in Nelsonville, and when the canal arrived, he expanded his business to include coal mining. In 1875, he sold his business to his sons, Clinton and William, who would go on to form the Sunday Creek Coal Company, which at one time was the second largest coal mining company in the world. By the late 1800s, coal was indeed king in almost every village and town in southeastern Ohio. In many cases, fathers and sons worked side by side in the mines and on occasion would die side by side in those mines. Railroads in southeastern Ohio grew alongside the coal mines. Where at first the canal system was the prime mover of coal, the railroads, which could run year-round, made coal mining more profitable, at least for the mine owners. Pay was often a problem for the miners who could barely support their families, and in some cases they were paid only with company script, which could only be used in the mine's own company store. From the late 1800s into the early 1900s, Chansey had at least a half a dozen mines working, four of which were operated by Columbus, Ohio-based companies, Big Bailey Mining Company and New York Coal Company, formerly the Manhattan Coal Company. The railroads changed everything. Early coal mines in southeastern Ohio were forced to ship coal by canal barge or by wagons as far as the early crude roads could take them. The canals were limited in the amount of coal that they could carry and by the season of the year. Of course, the canals would freeze over in the winter. The canal did open up the market for Hocking River Valley coal, carrying much of it back to Columbus. But as the railroads moved into the valley, they quickly became the preferred way of moving the coal along with clay and other bulk materials to the manufacturing centers of the state.
Looking at a 1800s map of Nelsonville, you can easily see the canal running through town, the original location of the Nelsonville Depot on the north side of the tracks, opposite from where the current depot stands. You can see coal mine operations on the hill east of the current Nelsonville Cross, and you can see just how prominent the Post and family was in the Nelsonville area in the 1800s. Perhaps the most tragic mine accident to occur in southeastern Ohio occurred here on November 5, 1930 at the Sunday Creek Coal Company Mine Number 6 located just east of Millfield, Ohio. The Millfield Mine Explosion. 82 miners lost their lives on that November day. Little remains here to indicate the tragic events that occurred here, save for a bronze highway marker and the smokestack, which still stands. Before the Millfield mine disaster, there had been another mining event that had gained fame worldwide. That event happened here in New Straitsville, Ohio. As we mentioned earlier, wages were always an issue with the miners. That struggle led to the Hocking Valley coal strike in June of 1884. 
by October of 1884, no settlement had been reached and mine owners began bringing in scab workers, replacing the striking miners. In protest, some miners in New Straitsville loaded timbers into mine cars at six New Straitsville area mines, set the cars on fire, and rolled them down into the mines. Their protest action caught the mines on fire, a fire that still burns underground today. It became known as the largest mine fire in the world and brought an end to much of the mining operations in the New Straitsville area. Some mining would continue, but never again at the scale it had reached prior to the strike. At the same time that coal production dominated in the Hocking Valley, another industry was blooming as well. The area's deposits of clay and shale, along with coal, led to the manufacturing of brick and tile products throughout the Hocking Valley. In fact, industry pioneer Peter Hayden decided to stake his future on the brick and tile industry along with his interest in the railroads. Hayden went into production of brick and tile products at a plant along the Hocking River at a location that still bears the name Haydenville today. Many other brick plants sprung up throughout the valley, including those in Logan, Nelsonville, Shawnee, and New Straitsville, just to name a few. And the railroads were also vital to the success of these operations. Sadly, little remains of these industries today, just a few relics of a bygone era. There were many mines scattered across the countryside and in almost every village and town in southeastern Ohio in the 1800s and early 1900s. Many of those towns remain today, but the mines are long gone.
While serious and fatal accidents were common in the mines of southeastern Ohio in the 1800s and early 1900s, only a few disasters were noted with the Millfield mine explosion taking the highest toll. Records do show that other tragic events occurred at both the Kimberly Mine and a mine in Buchtel, but no detailed reports can be found for either. In general, mines in the Hocking Valley actually had a fairly good safety record overall, and with the passage of time, rules and regulations were passed at the state and federal levels that would continue to improve mine safety. Considering the crude conditions that the early coal miners worked in, and the fact that children many times worked alongside their fathers, it is remarkable that the death toll was not far higher. Some coal mining can still be found in southeastern Ohio. However, many of the new mining operations have failed due to the current economic and ecological pressures that the mines must face. <music>